This is Radio Boston. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. And I'm Anthony Brooks. Colonialism brought jazz to Shanghai in the early 1900s. Now, Dave Liang is bringing it back to the United States with the Shanghai Restoration Project. This weekend, he'll be performing his East-West Electronica at Mass Mocha. Liang was born in Lawrence, Kansas. He graduated from Harvard, and like a lot of kids, he grew up playing classical music, but also loving jazz, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday. But his Chinese parents also introduced him to names like Zhou Xuan. He pays distant homage to her influence in this track called Miss Shanghai. I sat down with Dave Liang earlier this week. So my project, Shanghai Restoration Project, was inspired by the 1930s Shanghai jazz bands, which for folks who aren't familiar, combined traditional Chinese instrumentation and lyrics with the Western styles of that time, which were essentially jazz. And it's really amazing. If you go to this place called the Peace Hotel, or Heping Fan Dian, in Shanghai, it's right on the Bund, where they have all these colonial buildings. And you sit there, and you can watch these old men play jazz. They have saxophones and brass instruments. The brass instruments would usually provide a nice rhythmical bed, sort of like one, two, three, four. And then on top of that, usually a Chinese uh, singers. Sometimes they would have this very famous woman called Zhou Xuan, who has sung a lot of the famous pieces back then. She had this really interesting soprano. And I think it was a combination of Chinese vocal style that might have been set a little bit higher in pitch than most Western jazz singers like Billie Holiday or Ella Fitzgerald. So it created this unique blend, I guess, of a very high, shrill voice, which had been softened a little bit by the accompaniment of Western jazz. And so when you first started the Shanghai Restoration Project, what is it that you were really trying to do? What I wanted to do was find ways to share cool elements of Chinese culture and Chinese instrumentation with Western audiences. Because I think too often, I live in New York City, and when you walk through the subway, you hear people playing the Chinese instrument. And it's pretty shrill when it doesn't have any natural accompaniment. There's, a, there's a guy at, uh, I mean, you, maybe you even know him who plays in Harvard Square. <laughs> uh, what's the instrument called? It's just like a single string violin. It looks yeah, like one. Called, it's called the erhu, and it actually has two strings, and the bow is stuck in the middle. I see. Yeah, I think a lot of people who've heard this instrument probably wouldn't necessarily have the desire to go and listen to more Chinese music, in all honesty. (laughs) So (laughs) I was hoping that there might be a way to set it in a context that would experience a little bit more appreciation. Returned to China in 2009. Is that right? Right after the um, horrible earthquake in in Sichuan province? Yes, I've been going quite a bit up until then, but um, in 2009, it was the first time I went to Western China, and I went with a very good friend, an American folk artist named Abigail Washburn. And there are a lot of Chinese ethnic minorities, specifically Tibetan, and there's another minority group called the Chang, and they live in this area. And the Chang minority in particular their people were completely decimated by Mm. this awful earthquake in 2008. So Abby says to me, Dave, I want to go out and I want to do a folk electronic remix. And what I want to do is take these folk songs that these kids had learned from their parents growing up. I want to take those songs, but I want to remix them with sounds of their environment and make an album that's accessible to the West, but also really retains an important element of of their culture. And it was an album called Afterquake. Let's listen to a track from Afterquake. This is called Salah. And in 
2010, um, you were part of an album called Expo, which I understand it's a compilation of independent Chinese artists who actually have much of their work online. Is that right? That's right. So I partnered with this great company called Neocha. And what Neocha does is it's an online creative community. So they started as a place where artists, whether visual or musical, could upload all their music, and then users would rank it and then mark which ones were their favorites. These are people, because China has a very underdeveloped music market, it was very difficult for them to gain recognition. In China, uh, most of the popular music industry is pretty much what you hear in karaoke bars. So we wanted to find a way to give these electronic musicians a way to make a little bit of money and get some exposure outside of their country. Um, before I introduce this next piece of music, I just want to be sure I'm saying it correctly. Big Pirate Tiakahasha? <laughs> it's Big Pirate Tiakasha. And Tiakasha, okay. Tiakasha is just, uh, so it's the name of a good friend of the girl, uh, Red Mushroom. She was the one who wrote the song. She's actually a folk artist, but I wanted to do a remix of her song because I loved her voice. She's an elementary school teacher, has a really cool voice, and she just wrote, um, I guess, a song making fun of her friend, and I said, wow, that's kind of fun. Let's do that. So Dave, I have to ask, I mean, the music sounds great, but the reality, as you well know, is that, you know, China is a place where expression uh, is not the easiest thing, let alone artistic expression, and compound that with trying to get your work online. So for you um, as an artist, what was it like to, to sort of reach out and work with other artists who do face such barriers when it comes to actually just putting their art out there? You know what was interesting? I, I probably had the same impression, I think, before I started on this project. But what I learned is that I guess as a result of the internet, there actually is a lot of artistic expression and, and freedom of expression within certain guidelines, obviously. But most young Chinese, things are going really well over there economically. And a lot of them, they have a certain confidence about their work, whether it's in their art or in their music. And they're not necessarily out to create trouble. I mean, there's really no reason to because, you know, life is pretty good over there. Mm. Dave, forgive me, but I, when I hear you say that life is pretty good over there for a lot of Chinese youth, no doubt that's true for a large portion of those Chinese youth, especially especially if you live in one of uh, China's major cities, you know, Beijing, Shanghai. But when you said that you wanted to produce a form of music that takes artistic expression from China and makes it more accessible to Western audiences, do you ever feel a little uncertain about the fact that you're taking such a small slice of that expression because that's what's available to you? I mean, I think the the wonderful thing about being able to do different albums and different projects is that I always try to investigate um, and try to explore a different element of Chinese culture. So in the 2009 After Quake album, we got to work with the Tibetan minority and the Chang minority. And then right now I'm working on a Chinese children's record. Mm -hmm. So taking traditional Chinese children's songs from all over the country and then remixing them in sort of a fun way. Look, at the end of the day, you're right. There's over one billion people in China and, you know, everybody has a different degree of satisfaction. So I sort of see every project that I do um, as ways to explore sort of different elements. And hopefully at some point I can get a little more comprehensive. But I'm well aware that right now I'm focusing on you know, focus slivers at a time. Mm. Well, on Saturday, you'll be performing at Mass Mocha, performing the music of the Shanghai Restoration Project. The music itself is just so cool and, and intriguing, but you've got a lot of a huge visual component as well. Yes, one of the great things about being linked to a city in, I guess, my artist name, Shanghai Restoration <laughs> Project, is that I get the chance to work with some very, very talented visual artists. And so during our show, which I perform with uh, an MC friend of mine by the name of Jamal Richardson, we essentially combine the music. We mash everything up DJ style. I play keyboards, but everything is set to visual of Shanghai that's done in an artful way. So whether it's time-lapse video, whether it's animation, or whether it's old Shanghai movies, there's a lot of rich content to draw from. And I wouldn't be able to pull off this show without the help of some of these very talented visual artists. It's a really fun 
fun combination, and it's a great way to share the story of Shanghai in a non-didactic manner, I guess. Um, hopefully, people see it and they're a little bit more intrigued about China. And we don't lecture at all; we just we just play the music, and hopefully, that does the trick. Well, Dave Liang is the producer behind the Shanghai Restoration Project. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks so much, Magda. Really appreciate it. Dave Liang and the Shanghai Restoration Project perform at Mass Mocha on Saturday. There's more information and a video of the project at our website, radioboston.org. And let's go out with one more track. This is Chinese Recess from the album Afterquake. Monday on Radio Boston, MIT President Susan Hockfield. As Congress debates major cuts to federal research dollars, Hockfield says that would devastate the academy's mission. A defense of government-funded research. Next week on Radio Boston. Radio Boston is a production of WBUR with regular contributions from the Angle at Boston.com. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. I'm Anthony Brooks. Have a great weekend and join us for more Radio Boston on Monday. It's your